Bergkamp makes a run ahead of it. Bergkamp suddenly changed pace through the centre. It's Bergkamp! That's magnificent! The move, and then this, which left Dabby's ass totally stranded. Hello and welcome to Burkett Wonderland. Unbelievably, we are going to be 10 years old on the 13th of June. Odds are we're not going to make it. Because uh, I tried to do a podcast this late in this week, and there's only one person available one day and one available another day. Sometimes I don't know why I bother. Talking about people and guests, and having people on. I've only got Harry Seamew. Some of you may know him as an Arsenal fan. Some of you may know him as a podcaster. Some may know him as the uh, the barbecue king, but I know him <laughs> as a guitar-playing legend. How are you doing, Harry? I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good to see you again. It's been a while. It has. Yeah, I've just been relying on that lot to come and do shows. Now they can't be bothered. I'm just going to go back to doing what I prefer to do, go and get people I know and I like on. So... Uh, lovely to have you on how's the, how's the world of podcasting and the world of being a journalist and commentating and writing so good. i mean i look i look at the day I look back at the days when you and tom were just starting off and now i see you and tom doing doing uh wonderful stuff um and especially you doing the radio and i think i know those people i listen to you on talk sport too and i go i know him i don't ring up though as, as it all going is it is it a shock and is it really busy yeah, it has been really busy. Touch wood, I, I can't complain. It's been a, a really good season for me. Um, I've got to do so many amazing things. Um, got to keep progressing, which has been amazing. So I can't knock it. Um, definitely prefer the radio side and the broadcasting side, though, to the writing. Um, mm -hmm. I started off doing a bit of writing at the beginning when I wanted to sort of change careers. And that's kind of faded away, um, if I'm being honest. It's it's not that I don't enjoy it or I don't like it. I just prefer the other stuff. And I feel like you have to kind of go one way or the other. Um, so, yeah, um, really good, really good fun. Got to work on the radio, got to even do a couple of games for the Arsenal earlier on in the season for the under 21s, which was streamed on the website, which was dream come true. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's great. I can't knock it. I'm just lucky. That I get to, that I've had another season of it, and uh, hopefully the next one uh, can uh, can get me through as well, and, and just keep going until I have to get a proper job at some point. <laughs> no, you'll be at, you'll be at a meal kit. I'll see you on match of the day. You and Tom on match of the day. Imagine that. Actually, not match of the day. No, on Sky Sports doing a, a post game just to chit chat. That would be uh, that's the future. Get rid of all those idiots like uh, Carrigo and uh, wouldn't know not Neville. Neville's good and Owen. There's loads of them. I don't like them. I suppose you can't comment on that anymore, can you? Just just, just on the off chance. <laughs> um, what else was I going to ask you? Um, no, it's completely gone. Oh, how can... I, I didn't realise that Hugh Wisencroft and Hugh Wizzy are different people. They both do talk sport too. And someone said... I said, it's funny how he's changed his accent. And someone went, you do know they're different people, don't you? I went, ah, how can those two names be so similar and not be the same person? Well, there you go. You live and learn. Have you met both? Uh, I've met Hugh Wizzy online like this, not yeah. not in person. I don't think he does talk sport too now. Um, I think he did in the past. For this World Cup stuff, um, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Hugh Wusencroft, I've bumped into him a couple of times at talk sport, but I, I can't yeah. say I know the guy. Um, but yeah, I've bumped into him once or twice. Have but yeah, they, they have got similar names. You're right. <laughs> have you got, uh, have you met Hadrian Durham and have you given him a poke in the ribs? So this might be an unpopular opinion on an Arsenal podcast, but actually Adrian Durham is actually really nice. Um, go on. <laughs> no, it was uh, Stan was the one who told me that the two hues are different. All oh, right. <laughs> I'm just po po pointing at him going cheeky. Yeah. So, yeah, Adrian Durham's actually quite nice uh, in person. I, and I maybe it's because he doesn't do the drive time slot anymore where he, he's tasked with winding everybody up. Um, that I feel that like that, but I've been sat next to him a couple of times this season at games, and um, I'll be doing commentary on one game, really kind of making sure I'm focused and trying not to mess up my words. And he's next to me, and he's going through the scores of about sixty four games at once, and and I just listen and I think bloody, I like that is that is incredible. Like, he's, he's a great broadcaster and uh, much nicer now that he doesn't wind up Arsenal fans as often. <laughs> those those. 
well, those 50ps don't bring themselves in do they per text all these ira8 goons i need if you if you ever speak to him and ask him did he ever nearly get run over by a white audi in the peterborough united car park because i was there and i was reversing <laughs> and i bumped into him and he banged on the back of my window and went i'm walking here and uh, some people said I should have carried on, but I didn't. I stopped because um, we. I think it was maybe pre-season. We played Spurs and lost six 0 Peter, that is because I uh, was my local boys, and I used to go there. I've been there quite a few times. But uh, there you go. I ask him. I remember to ask him. <laughs> I doubt he's been trying. Anyone's tried to run him over. I was reversing, so I didn't really see him. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, th- I think it's probably the best that I did stop. Um, right, let's get straight into it. Is is a very small and unimportant question. Where did it all go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> good luck i'll be yeah. back in an hour <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's a tough one it's been a real tough one to take because on the one hand the fact that we're in this position is something that i don't think many people saw coming is something that we should be proud of it's something that signifies major progress but at the same time when you don't then go on and finish the job there is going to be that disappointment and i think you know, Manchester City were always going to go on an incredible run and, and we always knew they were capable of that. But for us to pick up two wins in our last eight Premier League games, I think is really, really disappointing. And where did it go wrong? I think it's a number of things. I think some players ran out of steam on an individual level, weren't performing at the level that they had shown for you know two thirds of the season. I think we lost key players, William Saliba being the biggest one. And in the time that it took us to work out that Rob Holding couldn't do that role, not because he's a terrible centre-back, just because he is not equipped to squeeze up the pitch and play in the progressive way that we wanted him to. In the time it took us to work out that Kivior should come in, we'd done a bit of damage. And also Kivior isn't Saliba level either. So, uh, you know, I think if you, you're going to highlight one area of the team, I think you have to look at the defence. I know we've had injuries there. Tommy Asu, who's been out as well, who could have been a solution to a lot of our problems as well, uh, given his versatility. But I think defensively is where it all went wrong for me because we just became so soft-centred and we we just would concede way too many goals. And you never even felt, even when we take a two-goal lead, that we were capable of seeing a game out. And that, for me, is is where it went wrong, I guess. Defensively, we just weren't good enough when it really, really mattered. Yeah, it was... Um, I was I've, I've got this thing where I am... Um, in fact, it'd be just too easy if I show everybody. People who have, have seen it have seen this before... Um, there it is. It's my um, Google spreadsheet on the win, draws and losses every game, every season, going all the way back to, well, quite a way back. And we were talking to someone the other night and they said, it looks like Arsenal ran out of steam by about game 30 because that's when the wheels came off and Saka would look knackered. And then we're looking at the season before where it kind of possibly ran out at about game 27. And the season yeah. before that, we ran out about game 22. Well, we, we ran out of steam after about game five. But you can see... <laughs> That at various points in the season where the wheels tend to fall off of stuff. But when you go and have a look at the, um, hold on, get rid of that. When you go and have a look at the, the stats that the, already this season, we, uh, we had, until the last game, we had the highest win, our winning percentage rate in the Premier League ever with 69.44%. The Invincibles was only 68.42%. And one more game to equal the most number of Premier League wins in a season. Um, this season, that's our third best points per game before the last game, 2.25. Um, the Invincibles only 2.37. And, and the number of goals that we're scoring, we only needed four more goals to break the record for how many goals that we've scored this season. Do you think Arteta is getting credit for that? Because it seems to be people are forgetting very quickly that stats do show that this season has been one of the best Premier League seasons ever. Yeah, I do. I think that people are obviously feeling disappointment now. And I've, I've been saying it for a few weeks. I think when the dust settles and, and the football finishes and we go into the summer and, you know, we've got a bit of time away from the game to kind of reflect with a calmer head. I think people will look back and say this was a, a really good, strong season from Arsenal. It's not easy to feel that right now or to, or to allow that to be your sort of main takeaway, because obviously the disappointment is there and it should be. You know, you want to win. That's how football goes. But yeah, this has been a really strong season from Arsenal. Really strong showing. Um, the stats don't lie, as you say. Uh, there'll be some stats that probably are a little bit worrying as well. I think the number of goals conceded in the second half of the season, for example, is something that we can look at and 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 certainly feel we can improve on. But 
you know, it's people have short memories in football. That's the problem. And I don't know about you, but for me, I can't remember. I've always loved the Arsenal. Of course I have. I've always been going to the games. I, I cover the club, but at no point in the last decade can I ever say that I was this engaged with Arsenal mm. as I am now. And that I was feeling as positive and as sort of, you know, I, I had to go back to the days of the Invincibles to feel like I would defend my football club for anything. Yeah. You know, there was a time where we started to not become apathetic, but people would would slaughter the club and you didn't feel like you could necessarily defend it too much because what you were seeing week in, week out was disappointing, was underwhelming. But now you feel like, you know, you're, we're, we're back again. The fact that everybody can't stand us, the fact that everybody's constantly talking about us, all of these things are signs that Arsenal are going through a bit of a revival. And you also, I guess, and, and people will say, I've got a losing mentality for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, I don't care. People need to realise what we're up against in Manchester City. 115 financial breaches hanging over them at the moment. I can't say 100% they're guilty of all of them, but the charges are there, which tarnishes what they've achieved, in my opinion, particularly if they come out and they're found to be guilty, which could take years. That's the real problem here. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you kind of have to redefine what success is if you're not Man City. Because Liverpool, who for four or five seasons recruited flawlessly, Jurgen Klopp was perfect in his coaching, in his tactics, in the way he would motivate teams, in the way he used the energy of the Liverpool crowd. All of those things were, were basically flawless. And how many league titles have Liverpool won in that period? Just the one. Just the one. So they were robbed. Yeah, well, yeah, that you know, you have to you have to realize what you're up against and and redefine success to a point. Now, obviously, you want to win the league, of course you do, but you have to realize that fi finishing second to Manchester City is not a disgrace. And actually, we've come a long way from where we were. You can't obsess about what everybody else is doing all the time. You have to focus on getting better yourselves, and we've certainly done that this season. Moving on to uh, just a little bit about next season, they has, they've got a hell of a lot of work to do. We're just looking at the players that 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 aren't any good, um, that are no good for the club. Personally, I don't rate Matt Turner. Uh, I don't think it's good for him to be at a club where he's only going to get five or six games. Well, this season he got seven games, and um, and like you're saying, uh, Big Bob probably not best for him. El Nenny isn't good enough. There's it, um, debatable whether Jorginho is going to be good enough. Um, Jacker is going to leave. I, I'd let Party go, and then you look at the others. Like I don't rate. I don't think Eddie's good enough. Nelson is going. Then Maitland, Niles, Pepe, Tavares, Trusty, Runnison, Suarez, Mari, Laconga, Balogun, Marquinhos. No, not Marquinhos. He, he's good enough to stay. All those players have got to go, and he's already had three seasons of getting rid of the deadwood. Do you think uh, Mikel, Edu, and Vinay are going to be able to get rid of enough players? Because this is like phase three of the dumpster and no, a fire sale, not dumpster fire. Wrong word. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think some of those players were good for the previous phase. Were good enough for the previous phase to be part of the squad. So, if you're competing for the Champions League spots, having a backup centre half like Rob Holding isn't really a problem. You know, because your you, your standard is lower. You're, you, he's going to come in, and you might drop a few points, but you can afford to drop points in the race for the top four, whereas you can't in the race for the title. I think there are a lot of players that fall into that category for me that were okay to be in the squad if we were pushing for top four, but we've gone beyond that. We've leapfrogged the, the top four, and we're now pushing for the title. So if you want to maintain that, then you have to upgrade in certain areas. The good thing about the way the season kind of capitulated if you want to try and put a silver lining on it for me, is that it's given me quite a bit of clarity with regards to what we still need to fix and what we still need to improve on. And sometimes you can fall into a false sense of security when things go your way, i.e. you stay injury free. You don't have to pull on your squad too much. Then players like Rob Holding, not meaning to pick on him, but just an example of someone who's not quite the level you need. You, you don't really put them in a position where they're exposed and therefore, you can sleep on them and think it's OK to have them in the squad moving forward. So at least we've got a bit of clarity around what needs fixing, what needs sorting. And um, I think there's a good three or four positions that we really need to strengthen in over the summer. I'm just hopeful that we'll be able to manage that and, and do the deals that we want. I always worry about Arsenal negotiating big money deals because they seem to have very sort of 
clear limits on what they will and won't do. And sometimes to get the player you need, you do have to just go that little extra mile. So that's kind of my only concern, I guess, going into the summer. Can we can we meet the asking price of some of these players that we're being linked with? I mean, that is worrying when you're looking at changing your midfield and it's going to cost you best part of £200 million. You're thinking, well... Wenger didn't probably spend most close to that in uh, in half of the time that he was here, and uh, it's it's going to be huge. And they they've got to work. I, th- I think Rice will work. I'm not overly fond of Rice. He's never stood out for me when I watched him play. But they're going. He's been playing against Arsenal for a very poor West Ham. Caicedo, he's very very good, and it looks like they're the two that are after. But how much money do you reckon the fabled war chest is going to be? Because if it's if it's going to be just those two, that's not enough, is it? No, it's not. And I, and I think we're going to have to sell this summer as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a couple of sacrificial lambs go this summer. So Kieran Tierney could be one of those. Mm. Um, not that I don't rate him as a fullback, but I don't think stylistically he quite fits in with what we're trying to do at the moment. And I think we've seen that this se- over the course of this season at various points. So I think he could be one that we look to cash in on. I think it's a good opportunity to move following Balogun on as well. I know a lot of people look at him and go, he scored a lot of goals and we should be bringing him back. But it's a, it's a bit like the Joe Willock situation for me where he went out on loan, his stock shot through the roof and it was either cashing on him now or bring him back to your club, have him be on the peripheries and then get half the money next summer without really learning anything over the course of that period. So, for me, if you could get upwards of 35, 40 million euros, which is what RB Leipzig are, are rumoured to want to pay for him or, or be willing to pay, then I think maybe you do that as well if it can help you fund um, sort of signings in in maybe more key positions and, and areas there where there's a greater need. And uh, Red Bull do have a history of bringing through really good players, buying young English players. Uh, there was a ESR went on loan there and he, he was okay. Um what do you think is going to happen with VSR? Do, do you want him to stay? I don't want him to leave. Um, I, I'm not sitting here saying get rid of him. But again, he could be one of those sacrificial lambs, if you want to put it that way, mm. because he does have a value. I, I've, I've, I've got to be honest, I've been surprised by how difficult he's found it to get back into the picture. Uh, you know, Fabio Vieira, for me, hasn't really pulled up any trees. I know it's his first season, but... Mikel Arteta's repeatedly turned to him before he's turned to Smith Rowe. I don't really know where Smith Rowe's best position is anymore. In his good goal scoring season last time around, he was doing it mainly from the left hand side. I think Martinelli's made that position his own. And then we've signed Leandro Trossard, who's better from the left than the right for me. We're hearing today that Reese Nelson has been offered a, a long term contract. So the club obviously want him to stay. Another one who, for me, is far more effective from the left than the right. And I don't really know, therefore, where Emil Smith-Rowe fits in. Is he, is he an eight? I, he hasn't been, so can we mould him into one? That's a big question as well. I, I don't know. I mean, what's your take on Smith-Rowe? Have you not been surprised by how sort of cast aside he's been, I guess, because he's been fit, but he still hasn't got a look in? I mean, when you're 3-1 down to Man City and you bring him on for the, the, the last few minutes of the game, you've got to think, well, there's something not right going on there. He's so adaptable, though. He is. Uh, it reminds me of Paul Merson, where he could play anywhere on the pitch. He could play anywhere at the front three. He could play in the eight. He could maybe even play in the Xhaka role. And he will just run all day for you. But he's also an injury worry. And I don't. some people have said that maybe it's like Martinelli. When Martinelli came back from his injury, Arteta didn't play him. He was on the bench a lot. He's getting a few minutes here and there. And hopefully that's what it's going to be with ESR because he's got the number 10. He's a wonderful player to watch. It's like a cross between Jack Wilshere and uh, and Paul Merson. And I love to see that. And hopefully we'll keep him. But a couple of years ago, Aston Villa offered us one, allegedly made a £30 million, £40 million bid for him. And I think Arteta might look at that and go, well, if I can get £40 million for a player that's on the, on the fringe of the squad... I could probably go into Europe and buy someone who's almost first team ready for that in other positions because, like you were saying, we are we have got so many players that can play in those wide positions. But all we need is someone who can play on the right to to, to be a backup for Saka because Saka is so tired. I mean, he should have Saka shouldn't have played the last three or four games of the season. I said after the um, the, the the Chelsea game. I said, the last two games of the season, Saka, Erdegaard, Ramsdale, Gabriel, all of that lot say, go on, off you go. You go and take your two weeks early, go on holiday. 
have that extra two weeks because you're not needed. The season's over for us. We're not going to win the league. But he didn't, and he played Saka again. And Saka is 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 running on empty, and the bloke is knackered. He's out of his. They know his tricks. They know his skills. They know what he's going to do. And that'd have been the perfect opportunity to say, ESR, come on, you've you've had a few games coming on the sub. You go off and play on the right hand side, drift into the left, come and drift into the ten like like um, like Jesus does, but doesn't. And it really makes me sad to think one of the best Halen products we've produced in in twenty years, one of the top three or four. And he might not be at the club next season. And that does make me sad because he's an Arsenal fan. Oh, I was on mute there. Um, yeah. No one knows. <laughs> I agree with that. I, I you know, I, I don't want to see him go particularly. I just, I feel it kind of happened with Aubameyang as well. I know there were other issues with Aubameyang, right? Where he obviously had the wrong attitude and there was fallings out and et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes a team evolves and people get left behind in the evolution and that happened to Aubameyang as a centre forward at Arsenal for me we started to play in a way where the centre forward was tasked tasked with dropping deeper was asked to string things together was asked to do a lot more unselfish work press etc and he just wasn't cut out to do that you know another example of that would be Kieran Tierney right now who is a fantastic fullback but can he play that inverted position? Can he be that extra man for us in midfield in the build-up? Can he break the lines in the way that Zinchenko can from deep? He can't do those things. And again, it doesn't mean that he's a bad individual or that he's not good enough. It just means that it's kind of putting a square peg in a round hole at the moment. And I just feel like with Emil Smith-Rowe, although I don't necessarily see it like that, I think Mikel Arteta may see it like that. And I think he will be wary of the fact that he needs to improve the squad and he'll be wary of the fact that the club have invested quite a bit of money over the last two, three seasons without Champions League football. And that at some point or another, whether it be public or not, which I'm sure it won't be, KSC are going to say, we need to re start recuperating some money here as well. We need to start bringing money back into the club as well as laying it out. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But if I had to bet on it, I'm kind of 50-50 at the moment, whether he's going to be an Arsenal player next season. And that, as you say, is a, is a shame. Talking of forwards, what's going on with Jesus? Is We've seen that over the years, um, Pep has changed the way that he plays football, whether he's gone from having uh, a, a, an Aguero, where everything goes through him and he's banging in 30 goals a season. Then when he was injured, they started using, well, Kalichi, uh, Ian Acho was playing for a little bit and then Jesus came in as a young Brazilian and then he was playing and then they started moving around and then the last couple of seasons with when um, Aguero was there, they stopped playing main striker because they didn't have one and they were doing the Jesus thing where he can play all over the place. And then he's uh, Pep has gone, actually, hold my beer, I'm going to play a striker. Comes in one season, breaks all the records. I mean, he's broken the, the number of hat-tricks in a season. He's broken the number of goals in a Premier League season. He's on the edge of breaking, of getting close to breaking the record for all competitions. So he beat, no, he's already beaten Clive Allen's one, which is 51. And I think the next one is Dixie Dean. There's a few others that he won't be able to break. Is Jesus the, the man to, to be out front for Arsenal? Because I, I've said this, and if people are listening, I'll say it every time. You look when Man City demolished us 4-1. look at the heat map for Haaland, their striker. You look at the heat map for the person who was meant to be out front for us, Jesus. And you think, well, hold on a second. He was very rarely out front. And so he gets in the way of Erdegaard. He gets in the way of the wing. He's a brilliant player. What he does when he gets that ball and he runs into the box is, is silky skills. It's beautiful to watch. But sometimes we need someone there up front to be able to put the ball in the back of it. And he's so often not there. Do you think Arteta sees that? And is he going to change it now that Pep has? I think he needs another option. I think that's what Mikel Arteta needs. He needs another option that gives him something a little bit different. Because I also think that for all the, the criticism that Jesus gets with regards to what he delivers in front of goal, which I agree with you, you know, it's not elite level, is it? You, you need to score more goals if you want to be put into that category as an elite centre forward. But I also think that he brings loads out of Saka, loads out of Martinelli, loads out of Odegaard. I don't think those players, all three of them, make double figures in the season without mm -hmm. Jesus being there. And I know they've improved as individuals, but you only need to go back to last season when they weren't playing with Jesus to see the difference in terms of the positions that they get into. A lot of the time, Jesus vacating those areas for me makes it possible 
for Odegaard to go into the box, makes it possible for Saka to go in, makes it possible for Martinelli to take over those positions. I think he's such an intelligent footballer. I think he's such a hard worker, real team player. Um, I love the way he presses, which is obviously a big feature of our game. So I don't, th I don't think Mikel Arteta is going to sort of rip it up and throw it away and and sort of abandon that that way of playing or all the things and the qualities that Jesus brings to the table. But I think you need to have another striker that you feel can come on and impact games. And I know he did okay when Jesus was out, but do you look at Eddie Nketiah as an opposition player when he's sitting on the bench and think, oh, you know, we've handled them for 70 minutes. What are we going to do when Eddie Nketiah comes on? You don't. And, you know, I know he's an ex-Arsenal player, but somebody like Olivier Giroud, for example, you know, you always looked at him and you thought he could impact this game. And, and we don't have that kind of second option anymore that you can throw on and you can just sort of change your style a little bit. I think we, we play one way at the moment. We try and open teams up through the middle and through those half spaces. But when we're forced to play wide, I don't always think we've got a solution in terms of being able to put the ball in the box and we end up turning back and going again and again and again. And it can become a bit repetitive and, and predictable, I guess. So I don't want to see sort of Jesus cast the side or, or I don't want to sit here and say that he's not good enough because I think he's improved us tenfold. But I think, yeah, to have another centre forward of a slightly different profile that we could use in slightly different situations, I think would be of benefit to us. And, and I hope that is one of the positions... They go out and address Eddie and Ketty has got that contract. Was that a ploy to be able to sell him on? Maybe, you know, I, I don't think that Mikel looks at him and thinks this guy is going to take us to the next level. I think it was sign him up. It's still cheaper than going and buying a second choice striker for this season. And we'll be able to sell him on with some value due to that contract. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he left this summer as well. I think there's a lot of players that we look at and maybe think are untouchable that probably aren't right now. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, like, do you want to see a, a more lethal goal scorer? Do you want to see a big man up front? Because that's something that's been talked about. What, what is it that you're kind of looking for in a centre forward that maybe Jesus doesn't bring to the party? Well, last season, I love a bit of Syria. Last season, after we didn't get Vlahovic, I like the bloke at Sosolo, that um, Shamakamaka that went to West Ham, been injured. But when I mean, he's six foot five and he's an absolute monster of a player. And I wanted someone like him, but he's kind of failed at West Ham, partly because of the football they play, partly because of the, uh, the injuries and partly because they've got Mikel Antonio. And I think that's uh, Moise's favourite player for, for doing that position. But he's done all right in the Europa League. I mean, in the Europa Conference League. But we do need someone like that. Eddie's last goals were against Man United when he came. He played in that game, scored two goals. And that was in January, I think. He hasn't scored a goal since January. And when Eddie comes on, he just looks like... Uh, he looks lost. He looks like he's read out there ready to be bullied. Like you've just told your child to go and tidy their room. He doesn't <laughs> look like a confident player. And you need to be a confident player to go out. And I understand why we gave him the contract, because that is a, a, a valuable player. And then... Um, I could see him possibly being sold to someone because a mid-table team are going to want him. And I think if you play 38 games a season, he will get you maybe 15, 20 goals if, on a good season, maybe 10 on an average season. But there are so many other things that you've got to look at. If I was playing as football manager, which is always how I end up resorting back to, I'd play Odegaard in the kind of Xhaka role. And then I'd play Jesus in the Erdegaard role because they can both do it and then they can both swap around a little bit or move out a little bit. But I can't have such an, in, in a nice way, such an ill-disciplined player as Jesus positionally wise, not as in his attitude because his attitude is great. But I can't have a player who, when the wing, when Saka and Martinelli are running down the ring at 100 mile an hour and they cross the ball in and you go, oh, hold on, there's nobody there over and over again and there's we, we need a big man there because we've seen that eddie doesn't really jump he's not very good at that jesus would need a ladder to get up to some of those balls and this it's not going to happen i want someone up there who is going to do it and now uh, juventus just had their 10 points taken away again it's like a yo-yo system there they're there we that means we're now in pot two for the champions league and vlahovic has been doing okay there but they are going to do a massive rebuild there because the manager when he's gone back there is uh he's he's not done it then I mean they are they were second in the league, but we, we, if we're going to move on, we can't have players that we're waiting to go. Oh, is this going to be the day that Eddie does it, or, or maybe next game, or maybe the next game? No, like you were implying earlier, we're big boys now. We have to put our big boys' pants on. We're playing in the Champions League. We're Premier League runners up. The good times are back. And if you can't bang in goals like that when you're given the chance by Eddie, I mean, if you if it, if I had to tell you to go on for twenty minutes 
and you don't do anything game after game after game or 10 minutes or whatever it is you're not you're not ready for it and we can't keep waiting for him to bring the kind of form that he had for the England under 21s record breaker to bring it to your first team game because he's not going to do it he's never going to do it he doesn't look like he's up for it which is uh sad for him but that's just the way that it goes is who would you like to see realistically up front if we if we did go for someone big I mean, Drew um, got a hat trick at the weekend. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's still got legs. One. It's a hard one um, to to kind of know. I mean, I'm always I, I'm a big Serie A fan as well, and and mm. there's a few players that often get talked about in Serie A as potential sort of Premier League players that I'm not sure how their skill set would necessarily translate um into the premier league i always have that worry i think there are some leagues where the transition is is easier so i think the bundesliga to the premier league is an e- easier transition Definitely. generally speaking um i think italy and spain are a little bit different and in particular italy i think what we've seen in italy over the years is strikers that have got big physical presence pace power all of those things really thrive in Serie A because they are above the rest in terms of those particular attributes. And when they come to the Premier League, those attributes become less significant in comparison to their peers and therefore they don't stand out as much. It's why I think Romelu Lukaku looks good in Serie A but doesn't look Perfect good in the Premier example. League. Um, you know, because in, in, in Italy, he's so much more powerful than everybody else that it stands out. So I'm always reluctant to kind of look at those players and say, yep, yeah, they'll definitely work. Vlavic for me, was someone that I really wanted when we were first linked to him. Like, really wanted him. But over the course of this season, I haven't been that impressed with him. And I don't know if that's because of Allegri or him. A bit of both. Juventus being really bad to watch this season. I I don't know exactly what it is. But for me, it, it depends on price. Because I don't think that Mikel is going gonna, is gonna to discard Jesus as the number one centre forward. So, my... I guess my idea of whether someone is worth it or not will depend on how much they're going to cost and then the knock-on effect that that has on us doing other business you know some people will say that if you you know if you're going to get you know like a Victor Ossiman I'd love him but that's going to cost you Hmm. percent of your transfer budget so I think it all depends on um on what we do elsewhere in the team but there's not really a name that stands out to me to be honest with you and uh, I know I've gone around the houses to say that but there's not anyone I can really think of that I would be rushing out to go and buy at the moment. I think this is one that needs some research. I think this is one that the scouts need to really spend some time on because it's important we have someone that can impact us in, in that way. But as I say, I think there are probably, for me, three positions at least where we need to do bigger business. And so this kind of falls down the peck in order in terms of importance to me. Um, I wouldn't mind Martinelli being used as a centre forward as well, you know. Oh, he's um, got the skills, hasn't he? He's got the skills, the yeah. pace. He's 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 got the big balls to go and do that. Mm. If you, you look at the last few seasons, well, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying Jesus isn't good enough. He's a hell of a player, but I just think at times it's frustrating. But then look at the fact that this season we scored 83 goals, and in the season where we had Lacazette and Aubameyang, two of the the finest strikers in in Arsenal history, we scored 56, 55, and 61 goals in those seasons. And to think, well, hold on a sec, let's start talking about changes because it's irrelevant. And like you were saying, it's other positions that we need to go and, and strengthen. Um, are you sad to see Xhaka go? Yeah, uh, I am. <laughs> I am. Um, I've been a big defender of Granit Xhaka throughout his Arsenal career because I always felt like he, like he got more criticism than anybody else, even when it wasn't always warranted. Obviously, there was the whole incident with the fans, which, again, to me, was not unforgivable. You know, to some people it was, but to me it wasn't because I, I could see why somebody who cares about what they do can explode in the face of that. I've exploded at things that I probably shouldn't have exploded at in life. So I I get it. I, I could kind of resonate with that or, or at least understand it. But I think what a character he must be to have been able to put that all to one side and become one of Arsenal's most important players because he's been that this season. And he's been so good that people have had to just even people that were his biggest critics have had to kind of wheel back on that and and give him the credit that he deserves. And now to see him sort of wanting to go as as we understand it, having come out the other side, feels like it was a bit of a shame. Like people always threw that stat at him, didn't they? That 
Arsenal haven't played Champions League football since Granit Xhaka uh, came to the club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, we're there now, and it feels like he's played a big part in getting us back there over the last 12 months, and now he's not going to be a part of it. So there is a, a bit of sadness for me. I mean, what about you? How do you kind of read the Xhaka situation? He he has the attitude that I would have. If you don't like me, then I'm going to throw my shirt at you and, and tell you to F off and things like that. That's the attitude that you need. But sometimes I think he forgets that he's playing in 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 the 21st century Premier League and he feels, feels like he's playing in 1980s First Division because you can't get away with some of the stuff that you do. And it will go down in Arsenal folklore, the, oh, would Xhaka have got away with that? We'd be saying that in 20 years' time <laughs> yeah. because so much stuff he didn't get away with because it took him so long to realise that you can't do that. But the passion that that bloke has and the willingness to, to go on. But we saw against Man City where the bad side of Xhaka came out towards the end of the game where he, he lost it. And maybe we can get better players than him, but I'll be so sad to see him go But He's going at the absolute peak of his time at Arsenal, which is why I'd keep him. And if we're going to get someone like Caicedo in and say to him, we want you to stay one more season, you're going to be playing a lot of games. Caicedo is going to be playing roughly in your kind of position. And what better way to learn the game from um, someone like him? And he's a lovely bloke. And we saw in the, uh, the Arsenal documentary, he's a family man. He's just a lovely, it's that kind of bloke that you, you want to be friends with. That, you know, if you're going to go out and there's going to be a bit of trouble, he's going to step in and, and try and protect you. But, yeah. he, but they're going to, he might end up uh, giving someone too much of a little bit of a slap. But I'm just sad to see him go. And what one hell of a buy if he's going to go. Is it Eintracht Frankfurt he's going to go to? Yeah, it looks like Bayer Leverkusen are, are um, leading the race. This is my issue with it. So my problem with it is that I, I agree with you when you said that there are better players out there. Of course there are. You know, of course there are. Stan says the upgrade is long overdue. Of course there's an upgrade out there. No, I don't think anybody's denying that. I think what my issue here is that I want us to build on the squad that we've got, not lose key parts of it along the way, because then are you actually strengthening? If you lose Granit Xhaka, you now need to go out and get a minimum of two top-class midfielders. Whereas had you added Declan Rice to Granit Xhaka, Thomas Partey, Martin Odegaard, Maybe Emil Smith Rowe fits into that somewhere as well. Maybe Fabio Vieira comes on next season to a higher level. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're moving forward. But at, at this point, what you'd be doing is you'd be losing someone really key for a nominal amount of money. 15 million euros is what's being said. And so it feels like this is something that's being driven by Granit Xhaka. And if, if it is something that was pre-agreed, which is what I've heard that, you know, he'd said at the start of this season that this was going to be his last and that he wanted to go back to Germany with his family, um, then fine. You know, if, if it is from him, then I think we owe it to him now to, to let him do what he wants to do, um, even if it means accepting slightly less money. But you're not going to replace him for 15 million euros, which is why this feels like a backward step letting him go. So I can only assume that there's some kind of gentleman's agreement there between him and Arteta, because we know that when Arteta came in, he was gone. His head was gone. He didn't want to be here anymore. And we know that Arteta talked him round to stay in. And, you know, at some point they've probably had a conversation that says, look, I want to be part of this journey for now, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go back to Germany. And um, he protects his family a lot. Um, I was lucky enough earlier this season to sit in on an interview with him that a colleague of mine was conducting um, and sort of meeting him and speaking to him off the camera and and sort of he, uh, his wife was there with him as well you could see that everything he was like asked or, or any questions any decisions that he was making with regards to this conversation he, he, he was he was talking to his wife he was like they're in everything together and it feels like if maybe his family want to go back to Germany then he wouldn't stand in their way and he'd make sure that that can happen so I think it is being driven by him but I am disappointed to see him go if indeed he does but it's criminal that a player's had his best season that costs us 35 million and he's what is he 30 31 that he's we're getting 15 million allegedly no one really knows because now uh, everything that goes on at the arsenal they're uh, getting very close to their chest all the leaks yeah, of course out of the club so he could be off to roma or he could go to anywhere like that but i can understand 
um, players in Germany, when you're out and about, they don't get hassled by the public. I mean, if he get, if someone sees him in his car, he's he's covered by a load of little rats all shouting and screaming and trying to stuff their phones into his car. And you don't need that in Germany. It'd be a much um, much easier life. They're more, much more respectful in Germany. And if, if he he's spent so much of his life in Germany, maybe he wants to go back to Germany and settle down and he could have another five or six years playing in that position, maybe drift back to a little bit more defensive midfield. But the game will be a lot easier for him in Germany. Um, I'd like yeah, to. And, and you said as well um, about the the thing with Roma last summer. Although I, I, I'm not saying that I don't trust the reports that we've had this time around or that I've got any reason to say they're wrong. He has been gone three times already and he's still here. So there is a part of me that is like, well, is this actually going to happen until it comes out of Granit Xhaka's mouth? Then I'm a, a little bit sort of, I guess, cautious about it is the way I'd put it. I want him to stay. Um, let's move on to um, probably the best Arsenal player that I've seen at the club for the last, uh, well, since the Invincible days, uh, a certain player called Mr. Saka. How excited are you by the fact that he signed a new four-year deal, 195 grand a week? I mean, that'll buy you a lot of Pokemon and a lot of Panini <laughs> stickers or whatever it is that he spends his money on. Is he the most important player at the club? And how do you feel about the people that have the utter nerve to say anything negative about him? I can't stand the criticism of him. Um, I think it's okay to say that his form has gone off over the last couple of months. Um, I think that's largely down to him probably being overplayed and our reliance on him is huge and it shouldn't be, you know? So I think people that are being really critical of him need to check themselves because he's had a wonderful season and he's been great for us for a good few seasons now and he's only going to get better and better. We know that, there were other clubs kind of sort of sniffing around him or, or sort of looking at what his contract situation looked like with the hope of making a move at some point. For him to sign that deal it is a big statement for us, I think, because it shows players that we're going after as well, not just the ones in-house, but the ones that we're going to go after, that we mean business. And we are focused on going out and tying these people down in a way that we didn't do previously because we ended up losing so many key players for either really small amounts of money because of their contract situation, or in some cases on free. So to see that Arsenal have learned that lesson is key. I, I, I personally think that there are... So I think Martin Odegaard is more important right now. That's just my opinion um, than Bukayo Saka. But I think what Bukayo Saka is for the club is the shining example of what Arsenal is all about. And so even commercially, aside from the fact that he's brilliant on the pitch, commercially, the fact that he went through what he went through at the Euros and came back and bounced back makes his story a gripping one, number one. The fact that he's a Hale End graduate and he's come all the way through the football club to the point where he is now arguably the best player in the team is an example that Arsenal can hold up to young players that they want to sign and say, this football club is a big football club. It does spend big money. It does have the power to go into the transfer window and bring people in. But it also offers pathways, if you're good enough, to make it to the very top. And Bukayo Saka is the example of that. He's the one that you hold up. I know we talk about Smith Rowe and Ketia, but Bukayo Saka is the one that's gone to a talismanic level in terms of how good he's been. And and I just think that has value as well, as well as what he can do on the pitch. And as and he seems like a really humble guy and, and the perfect ambassador for the football club as well. So outside of just his football stuff, he's a, he's a great person to have around. And I'm glad that they got it done. I know that people have known that it was coming for a little while, but you always feel that a bit better when you get the club official announcement, don't you? It's just, uh, I think we all knew it was going to happen. He doesn't seem the sort that would go and bugger off and... He, hopefully he stays at Arsenal for the whole of his career. I mean, he's 21, he's 22 in September. He's played 178 games for the Arsenal already. That's more than players like Will Todd and Munia, Bentner, uh, Tony Woodcock, Sanchez, Aubameyang, um, Holding, Elneny, Coughlin. Um, just so so many players that he's played. I mean, more than Arteta and Vermaelen and it's just amazing what the, what the, the potential that that kid has got and what's he got 26 games and eight goals for england or 28 games and six goals it's one of those two some combination and it's just he's just fantastic and he isn't on the one to a 10 he's not even reached about a six or a seven yet and once he gets to an eight or a nine he'll stay at like that for 
years to come. And it's just, he is, he is, when you look at, think about Arsenal, he's the player that you think about the most. And the fact that on Twitter, people, so many people hate him, that just shows how good he is. Yeah. Because they hate him. And then I didn't even think about this the other day. I thought, well, hold on. He's a wonderful player. He's doing great for England. He's a joy to watch. Hold on. I hate Harry Kane. Oh, yeah, there you go. I didn't really like Sterling. And now I realise why. Because uh, they are good. And you, they only get angry when they are that good. Yeah, um, exactly. What else should we talk about? If he plays um, against Wolves on Sunday, he'd be the first outfield player to play back-to-back full season since Lee Dixon in... 89, 90, 90, 91. I mean, that says something, doesn't it? Yeah, it's remarkable, isn't it? It, it really, really is. And, um, you know, his journey in the team as well has been an interesting one. He came in as a left back, didn't he, at, at one point? Played left wing back, played left back for cover, played in a 10 position at times. And then he eventually found his home on the right hand side. And he's made that his own so much so that he's undroppable. And, and, um, and, and someone, as you say, this going to play basically back-to-back seasons I do think although we talk about him overplaying and we talk about the need to protect some of these players I do think there's something in a comment that Mikel Arteta made recently which was if you want to play at the highest level and win all the big trophies and, and be right at the pinnacle of the game you've got to learn to play every three days and I don't know how you manage that I know that some players do a little less in training as a result of the fact that the games come thick and fast, obviously you do your pre-season and then when you get into the business end of the season, your fitness levels are there because of the match practice and you try and sort of manage your routine a little bit better. Maybe it's something behind the scenes that needs to be adjusted in terms of his training regime, but he, he has run out of gas a little bit and I think we've got to find a way of of managing that better so that we can get the best for Kyo Saka for the course of, uh, of the season because I think we... We saw this a little bit last season as well. So it, it's not just a one-off for me in terms of him just sort of running out of gas at the end. So it's not a criticism, but it's something that we can certainly improve on and, and he can improve on as well to go to that next, next level. And this season, the most number of minutes played by any player is uh, Gabriel centre back, 4,043. Next is Saka, 3,684. And then Ramsdale, 3,630. And Ramsdale's played nearly every single game for so Shaq, uh, so Saka to be above that just shows. But fourteen goals, ele- fourteen goals and eleven assists, and he's, he's still only going to get better. What's your thoughts on Saliba? Because for me, there is no better prospect at centre back on the planet at the moment, and he could do a David O'Leary, a Tony Adams, spend the rest of his career at Arsenal, and it'd be a fight between Saka, Ramsdale. And Saliba to to break the record, the seven hundred and twenty two by O'Leary. I mean, I think Ramsdale will do that if he stays at the club until he can be playing football at forty. But are you worried about the Saliba deal? What do you think is happening? I think the club are quite confident that they're going to get it done. Um, that's that's what we're hearing. I am not massively worried about it at this moment in time. I think that it is something that will happen. I kind of prepared myself for the fact that this was going to be a tougher negotiation. Then the ones with regards to Saka, maybe Odegaard, which we're hearing is ongoing at the moment, Ramsdale. And the reason for that is because William Saliba's start to life at Arsenal was a difficult one. And his relationship with Mikel Arteta at the beginning was probably a bit strange, should we put it that way? Because he came back from that initial loan spell um, and was sent out on loan again. Then there was the whole thing around... Uh, You know, he wasn't registered to go out on loan and he wasn't registered to play in the Premier League. And he spent sort of a a few months in the cold. And then he went off to Marseille and and, and proved himself after a spell. I think think it was Nice in between. And then he's come back and he's just been incredible. And he then is in a position of power where he can say, look, you, you sent me out on loan. Maybe at the time I didn't see it as the right thing and and we know he didn't think it was the right thing, but he's come back now and he probably quietly deep down feels like actually those loan spells did him good and he wouldn't have been as equipped to deal with the Premier League had he not had that extra season, I think, with Marseille. That was the big one for me, the one where he really went up another level because he was playing at a club where the pressure was there to win every week. Marseille are a huge football club. Okay, the league isn't the same standard, but to have that pressure every week at a big club, big crowd, big expectations, it kind of conditions you for a move to somewhere like Arsenal. So I think the fact that he's had such a good season and that he knows he's good 
and that he knows that Arsenal will be a little bit on edge about getting this done quickly because of the fact that they know his relationship with them at the beginning wasn't great. I think it puts him in a really strong negotiating position or his people in a strong negotiating position. And for that reason, I think they're going to try and squeeze as much out of Arsenal as they possibly can. And rightly so, they should. You know, they're in that position for a reason because of how good he's been. But I just always thought that this was going to be a more complicated negotiation because of the power that he holds, given what's left on his contract and how good he's shown himself to be. So not panicking. I think it will get done, but I think we're going to have to really push the boat out to make it happen. And I think most of us would agree that it's uh, it's worth it. But like Matt D'Souza says here, Saka signed a four-year deal. He'll want 400 grand in a couple of years' time. It, it, don't the players look at that and go, well, if I'm getting all the money now, then what incentive am I going to have later? Because not everyone's going to get the Haaland 650 grand a week with bonuses and all of that lot. And the club must have that in mind and go, well, we want to pay give you a pay rise. And plus the club, no, the money means nothing to these players. It's a status thing. I want to be the highest earner. That's why players go to clubs and have it in their contract. They've got to be the highest earner. And so you've got to take all these things into consideration. And like when you're playing football manager now, it is an absolute ball ache when you have to do the the contracts because they just want so much and they're so unwilling to budge just because they can go and go on the highest second highest earner at the club now. But where where do you go if you if you're offering if if like some are saying he's on 195, some are saying he's on 350 for Saka, well, where do you go at the age of 21? Where does he honestly think? that the, the contract situation is, is going to go because at some point you're going to go, well, we can't afford to pay you anymore. And the same with Saliba. Yeah, that's the problem that so, sort of a, a group of clubs have created in football now where they've set the bar in terms of the going rate for top talent ridiculously high. And if clubs really want to stick to that wage structure at certain points, they're going to have to lose players that they don't necessarily want to lose. I think what we've seen at Arsenal is a, is a bit of a, a shift behind the scenes in terms of an acknowledgement of what we need to spend to be able to compete. Um, you know, we always talked in the past, didn't we, about KSE maybe being happy enough to fund the Champions League push, but never willing to give us that little bit extra to go that step further. I'm hoping that they've, they've clocked on and realised that if you want to compete at the very top, then you do have to push the boat out sometimes. And, you, you know, equally though, I think if you can protect yourself against those problems by being smart in the way that you do business. So the fact that we're extending people's contracts proactively rather than reactively means that we're protected with a lot of players and we can at any point press the exit button on somebody and generate a big amount of money at any given point. And we couldn't do that for the last three or four years. So because of that, I think there is a, a reluctant, uh, there is a willingness now to go that extra mile when it comes to paying people. So, for example, you know, let's talk this summer. You could sell Emil Smith Rowe for 35, 40 million. You could sell Kieran Tierney for 35, 40 million pounds. You could sell Balogun for that because of the season he's had. All of a sudden, there are three or four players that you could move on that wouldn't completely kill your squad but would bring you the type of money that allows you to, to fund a big deal like the Saka deal or like the Saliba deal that we're hoping to do. So I think if we protect our assets properly, then I think the club will feel more comfortable to, to push that extra mile when it comes to contracts and wages uh, without it being as much of a problem as it maybe was in the past. So if you operate correctly all round, then I think you can get to that place where you can jump that little bit further. Um, and uh, and compete with the big boys when it comes to salary. Because if you want to compete with the big boys in terms of on the pitch, you're going to have to. Yeah, but sometimes it's not just about money. It's about um, winning stuff, which for me is the most important. All right, let's do a few questions before we go. Um, Avon says, I'd be interested to hear Harry's take on the event Juventus situation, whether the 10-point deduction will stand as it affects our Champions League draw, moves us from group pot, two to, pot three to pot two. Yeah, uh, the, the Juve situation is a mess for me. For me, they should never have deducted the points in the first place without being sure or without having concluded the case. Then they put the points back and now they're going to deduct 10, which would take them out of the top four and put them in a position where they're fighting going into the last couple of games. 
for Champions League qualification. Obviously, for Arsenal, the benefit is, as you say, we'll move up into pot two because of the coefficient rankings, um, which will be better for us. But if I were a Juventus fan, I'd be absolutely livid because this is a mess. And the news came out yesterday, I think about maybe an hour before they went out to play away at Empoli and they got absolutely thrashed um, as well. Yeah, 4-1. 4-1, yeah. So I I just think the way it's been handled is a mess. And um, Juventus have been plodding along all season. They've not been great to watch. They've not been inspiring or anything like that, but they have been effective and efficient uh, under Max Allegri. I think a lot of people associated with the club recognise now that they need to rebuild, refresh, etc., etc. But being in the Champions League would have helped with that quite a bit in terms of the finances to be without it off the back of having had the points taken away, then given back and then taken away again is it is a mess. But then, you know, it, Mourinho said it yesterday, and I don't often agree with Jose Mourinho, but he said it impacts the integrity of the championship, giving points, taking points away, re- restoring them. And he's absolutely right. He said his, his team would have approached Serie A differently over the past few weeks with their European commitments had they felt they had a chance of making the top four, i.e. had Juve not been given their points back. And now they've been taken away again. So, you know, it's just a mess. It it really, really is. And, you know, I guess the the only positive is that at least in Italy, even the powerful, influential clubs uh, do get in trouble when they break the rules, unlike here. And thought it's funny when they said to Allegri, "Will you be leaving?" He said, "No, I don't want to be the first one leaving a sinking ship, or, or I don't want it, or, or something along those lines." Uh, Matt has asked a couple of questions. We'll just go for this one. Would Harry sign Kulabetsky for thirty-five million? No, um, I, I think he's okay. Um, always looked very hit and miss to me during his time at Juve. Came to Spurs, had some brilliant games, some brilliant periods, but also went missing uh, for long periods as well. So. He's a, a bit inconsistent for me, and I don't know that I'd spend thirty-five million on him uh, if Spurs don't sign him. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm unsure on that one, so I'd have to say no. Um, Russ Morgan says, "What do you think of Romeo Lavia, who is the big the Belgian defensive midfielder at at Southampton? He's only nineteen. I thought he was a lot older than that, but he's ex-Man City, so obviously Arteta wants him." <laughs> Yeah, if anybody wants to sign him, they have to do it this summer because next summer, I understand that City have a buyback clause that they can trigger, but they have to wait until next summer. Um, And and that's obviously their deal with Southampton. So if you take him away now, that becomes irrelevant. For me, he's not ready yet. He's not going to come in and hit the ground running. He's not going to be an instant hit, an instant success. Clearly, the talent's there, but I think he's still... A bit of a project player and I don't think that's what we need at this phase if you like I think we need a ready-made player to come into that midfield and help us another quick one boy 10 says what's the maximum you would accept Saliba being played being paid no being played I know it's not your money I think he means paid yeah even though we know it's not our money what would you go for Max <sighs> if Saka's on 200 then I think Saliba's ceiling is that high as well. So I think mm. that he's well within his rights to ask for 200. So around about that would be the ballpark figure. If I had to go to 220, 230 to make it happen, I'd probably do that as well. Yeah, agree. Uh, Rancid Pumpkin, Harry, do you see Jesus' future as wide as future out wide as a Saka competitor? If we have another centre forward option that I trust, then I don't have an issue with us making that rotation. We saw him do quite a good job on the right for City at times. Um, and, and obviously, you know, he will drift in field. He will get involved in other areas and in other spaces. We also see Odegaard drift out to the right quite a bit, don't we? And sort of link up with Saka. So if there was that fluidity to the system, it wouldn't be an issue for me. But that's only something you can do if you've got a competent centre forward. And I don't think with the options we currently have at our disposal, we can afford to take Jesus out of the middle. And, and not see the standard drop. So if we got a, a good striker in in the summer, then yeah. But if we didn't, then Jesus is needed for me very much through the middle. Uh, final question from Karg Weng. Are we at risk of violating FFP rule if we go big in the transfer window this summer? What even is FFP anymore? <laughs> I don't understand it. it. Depends on how good your lawyers are. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand it. I don't think the clubs understand it. I don't think the Premier League know how to actually enforce it. 
you know, we've seen it across Europe as well. We've seen teams inflating the values of players that they've sold. And we've seen all sorts of ways around it. If you've got big money, you can get big lawyers. And if you've got big lawyers, you can find your way around these things. So for me, FFP was only ever going to work if it was implemented properly and it hasn't been. So am I going to sit and worry about it? Not really, but it is obviously a valid point and, and one that the club will have to think about. But I think I think Arsenal will, will know what they're doing and, and will be able to kind of dance their way around it just like everybody else has. Excellent. Well, there you go. Um, that is it. We are done. One hour with Harry Simu from the uh, Chronicles of Aguna and many other places like Talk Sport 2. Uh, Harry, tell people where they can find you if they want to come and stalk you on the internet. <laughs> uh, best place is Twitter, at Harry Simu. You can find me there. Um, I post the links to most of the things I do there. Uh, Chronicles of Aguna podcast as well. We're actually going to go live in a little bit. Uh, with myself and Mike Stavrou. Um, now of The Athletic is uh, Mike Stavrou. Ooh, moved up, um, top tier. Yeah, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. So we haven't done a pod together for a little while, so we've got lots to discuss. So uh, join us on that if you're free. Excellent. I am doing. I'll, I shall be listening to that while I will be editing. Right. Um, thank you very much, everybody in the chat. If you are new, feel free to give a thumbs up or maybe even subscribe, and we will send you a bill for a thousand pounds for every month that you have subscribed to. And if you want to get the link to this uh, podcast, put it in an email and CC it to everybody in your company's database. It'll be all right. Tell them I said it's fine. Harry, lovely to catch up with you again, and we will no doubt speak again later. Thank you so much, mate. Always a pleasure. All right, then. Thank you very much. And I'm going to do the outro. Um, we might be back this week for another podcast. I really don't know. Thank you very much. Goodbye. As soon as I scored that goal, I was fucking livid. Get down, dog. Splendid business. He nearly caught the bloody thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I've just eaten a full quiche. Well, you don't often see him at him. So when you see him in the supermarket, they need to be swagged. Microwaved immediately and get the brown sauce on one. Bosh, Bob's your uncle. Never in doubt.